I want you to close your eyes for a minute. I still see eyes open. Close your eyes. I promise I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to stay right here. And I want you to think about God. Now, do you have an image in your mind of what God looks like? Every one of us, whether we think we do or not, when someone starts talking about God, has an image of what God looks like. Okay, you can open your eyes now. That image is something that we created. It's created out of our understanding of what the Bible tells us. It's created out of our understanding of of how other people have interacted with us and taught us about God. It's created out of many different things. And so my image of God is not going to be the same as your image of God. Right? But if we could somehow morph all of our images together, we would probably get pretty close to what God looks like because none of us has a complete understanding of who God is and how God works in our lives, right? And by now you're probably wondering, well, this is really good because he's not talking about that lesson because I really don't want to hear about that lesson. But guess what? Here we go, right? Jesus tells us these things here this morning that are super hard to do. Right? And we have to remember where it comes from, right? We're still in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, which is the Sermon on the Mount, right? This is Jesus' first teaching. It starts with Jesus going up the mountainside, taking his disciples with, or sitting down and his disciples and all of those gathered coming and listening to him. And he starts with the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those. And then he teaches us about salt and light, right? That he wants us to be salt and light. Is that what he said? He said, I really want you to be salt and light for the earth. Is that what Jesus said? Do I need to preach that sermon again? Nobody is saying anything. Did Jesus say he wants us to be salt and light? He said, you are Salt. And you are light. He didn't say He wants us to be that. He says you are that. You're going to go do that. And here Jesus is saying, you have heard it said. Who said it? You've heard it said. Who said these things? Where do these things come from? Where? Where? The Ten Commandments, all of them except one. Which one? Murder, adultery, swearing falsely, which is false witness. And the last one is divorce, which doesn't come out of the Ten Commandments, but comes out of Deuteronomy. Jesus is quoting basically out of Exodus and Deuteronomy here. You have heard that it said to you, do not murder. But I say to you, if you're angry with a brother or sister, you've murdered them in your mind. Right? Jesus says, you can't be angry with someone else. How easy is that? Here's a little sidetrack for us this morning. We're going to learn a little bit here that doesn't have to do with the sermon, but we're going to get it during the sermon. Um, We share the peace in our service before we come for communion. And why do we do it there? Some congregations do it at the beginning of service. Some congregations do it at the very ending during ascending. Some do it at the beginning when you first gather in. We choose to do it. I choose to do it um, before we come here. Why? Why? What does it say here in Matthew when Jesus says, you've heard it said you shall not murder, but I say to you, don't be angry. If you're coming to the altar to bring your gift, right? Jesus is talking to the Jewish community who would bring sacrifices to the altar. And we no longer have to bring sacrifices to the altar because the greatest sacrifice has already been made. But Jesus says, if you're coming to the altar and you realize on your way there that you have something against your brother and sister, what do you do? You leave what you're bringing and you go and you make amends. 
We share the peace before we come to this place. So that if there's somebody that you need to make amends with, you have that time to seek them out. And to come to this place with a true, clean, and open heart, ready to receive what it is that God's going to give us. Because being angry with somebody is the same as committing murder against them because that keeps us separated from where God needs us to be. And then he goes on, you've heard it said, what's the next one? You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, if you've looked on someone wantingly, you have already committed adultery with them in your mind. And then we get this neat little phrase. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. For it's better for you to go to heaven and to go into the fires of hell with your whole body, missing a body part, than to go into the fires of hell missing with your whole body. Or if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Because it's better to go into heaven missing a body part than it is to go into hell with your full body. I, I, I have to wonder about this passage. Either we don't take Jesus seriously or we're all lying. One person got it. (laughs) Right? I've never known anyone to pluck out their eye or to cut off their hand. But every last one of us have sinned in some way or another. And this just doesn't mean adultery, right? It doesn't just mean... It means in any case, sense or form, if you look upon something wantingly, if you look upon something that somebody else has and you want it, then you should pluck your eye out because it's causing you to sin. Right. And how many of us have done that? You're not old enough to have done that yet. That's just impossible. (laughs) Right. We either we don't believe that Jesus meant this or we're lying to ourselves. Well, what did Jesus mean here? And Jesus goes on, he says, uh, you've heard it said that whoever divorces needs to give a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that you shouldn't divorce because when you divorce someone, you you make yourself and that person an adulterer. Right. I actually have a friend um, in North Carolina who will never get married again. She was married and is divorced. And she says she she will never get married again. She'll never have a, a relationship a a strong committed relationship with a man again because of these verses. Because it says specifically here in black and white that if if you get remarried, that you make someone commit adultery. And she cannot call someone else to sin. That's a conviction. That's a living your life the way that God has called us to, to do. I'm not saying that I agree with her, but I'm saying that she has a conviction to live with something that she believes so powerfully that she will not break that because she doesn't want to cause somebody else to fall into sin. And then Jesus goes on to say, uh, you, you've heard it say, do not swear against any, anything, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. What is all of this about? You see, it's about the great unholy trinity. Have I preached about the unholy trinity here before? I have one confirmation student going. I don't know if that's just your an involuntary head bob there or if you're actually answering my question. Right? The unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. Right? That's what this is about. That's what all of this chapter so far has been about. It's about looking out for the other. Right? It's about not putting ourselves first, but thinking about someone else before ourselves. Jesus said, you shall not commit. It's been said to you, you shall not commit murder, but don't be angry. Because when you're angry, that causes animosity between you and your brother. And that causes a wedge to come between you and God. And do not commit adultery. Do not look on something else that's not yours. Do not think about something else that's not yours. Because that puts animosity between you and that person. It puts animosity between you and God. It drives a wedge in between your relationships. It makes your focus be about me. It's what can I get How can I make myself feel good? What's in it for me? And it's not about me. It's not about us. There's a best-selling book out there. I forget the name of it. It's it's your best life yet to come or something like that. Your best life now, actually, is what it is, I think. Um, 
I read it quickly as I was looking through stuff this past week. But it's a, it's a best-selling book that tries to help you get your best life, right? And, and Ralph Jacobson, who is the, who is a professor of Old Testament at Luther Seminary said, it would be better if that book were titled, entitled to be a Christian book. It need to be entitled Your Neighbor's Best Life Now. Because that's what Jesus tells us right here. You know? Don't lie. Don't divorce. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't do something that's about you. Do something that's about your, them, your neighbor. Because when you do something for them, you are going to be replenished in return. When we think about ourselves and do what's only good for us, then that takes away from what God has already done for us. Because you see, it really is about what that image of God is. Because I said earlier, each one of us has our own image of God. Martin Luther was asked by his students um, what his image of God was. And Martin Luther replied that his image of God was Jesus hanging on the cross. Because that's the greatest outpouring of love that God ever gave to us. Because it's not about God. It's about us. It's not about us. It's about God. Did you catch that? To God, it's not about God. It's about us. To us, it has to be about God. Which means that someone else comes first. So how do we live up to what Jesus has told us here? We don't really have to cut off our hand or pluck our eye out. But we have to focus ourselves, like I told the kids up here. It's a day-by-day thing that we have to focus ourselves on God and understand what we're trying to do. To live as disciples of Jesus. To follow after what He's teaching His disciples in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. To live as something that flavors the world, that sheds light on the darkness, that brings His love to, to light in the darkest places of this world. To give to someone else. To not think about ourselves. And I'll be the first to tell you that I'm guilty. Because it's not easy to do. But it's something that if we follow after Jesus, and we pray to Him daily, and we study His Word, and we share in fellowship, and and take communion, and, and, and are infused with His Spirit, He will lead us and guide us down that path to help us better understand who we are as His creatures so that we can live in a place where we show love. Because that's exactly what he called us to do. So follow after Jesus. Looking to love another. Knowing that he will refill you.